Welcome. Good morning and good evening. I am Takatoshi Ito, Director of Program on Public Pension and Sovereign Funds at the Center on Japanese Economy and Business, also known as CJEB at Columbia Business School, and Professor at the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University. Thank you for joining us for Why Has Japan Become So Cheap? Part 2. Before starting today's conversation, I will briefly introduce CJ as we may have newcomers uh, listening in. The center was established in 1986 by Professor Hugh Patrick and Professor David Weinstein became director in 2019. CJ's mission is to promote knowledge and understanding of the Japanese economy and its business systems in an international context, in part through the many conferences, symposia, lectures, webinars, and workshops held throughout the academic year. CJEB is the only research center focusing on Japanese economy and its business systems within a university setting in North America. So that uh, makes uh, the center and CJEB very special. Today's conversation will be a continuation of the topic of my annual lecture held in person on campus last month with the same title. Uh, the story has two parts, prices and exchange rates. I'm joined by Tsutomu Watanabe, professor of economics at the Graduate School of Economics of the University of Tokyo, my former colleague and uh, research associate at CJ. He is now regarded as a top expert on high frequency dynamics or lack thereof of Japanese prices, commodity by commodity and service by service. He received his PhD in economics from Harvard University in 1982 and did his undergraduate work at the University of Tokyo. He has held visiting positions at the various universities, including Kyoto, Bokoni, uh, and other places. Stomu is the author of many books and more than 70 academic journal articles on monetary policy, inflation dynamics, international finance, and other topics. He was the project leader of two previous JSPS granting aid for scientific research projects, developed uh, the Nikkei New Tokyo Daily Price Index with Kota Watanabe, and in is principal founder of Nowcast uh, Inc. Beyond being a CJ research associate, Tsutomu is a close friend of the center and regularly engaged in Japan, uh, Japan Economic Seminar, or it's wonderful to have back uh, for this event. I also want to take a moment to thank our corporate and individual sponsors for their generous donations. Uh, these gifts allow us to continue developing and delivering exceptional programmings. Thank you very much. And Stoma and I will be talking questions. Uh, we'll be taking questions from the Q and A feature on your Zoom toolbar. So please send some good questions for us, and and um, uh, we will um, answer those questions as much as we can later. So, all right, so let's begin. And um, uh, first, uh, here is uh, how we proceed. Uh, uh, in, uh, first, I will do my presentation and uh, Tsutomu will follow uh, with his presentation. Then uh, we open the dialogue between, uh, between us and cover some of the topics which we may find uh, uh, differences in our opinions. Then we'll take some questions from uh, Q&A. And if time allows, we will talk about policy prescriptions um, uh, at the end. Okay, so um, let's start with the um, uh, facts that um, uh, why, uh, how, how much Japan is cheap. And uh, this is ramen, uh, Ippudo Shiromaru, which is uh, exactly the same product in Tokyo and US. And uh, in Tokyo, it's uh, 820 yen. In the US, it's $18 plus tax and plus tip. And the, uh, uh, at the 140 yen per dollar exchange rates, 
the U.S. Uh, ramen is about four times of the Tokyo ramen, the same ramen. Same Big Mac cost about twice uh, in New York compared to in Tokyo. And uh, Amazon Prime, uh, 4.6 times in US. And Uniqlo, same product, uh, is uh, uh, 1.8 times uh, in, in the US. Now, lastly, uh, our last comparison is the tuition of University of Tokyo and Columbia University. And this is a comparison tuition only and room and board is um, uh, not included. And um, uh, it's a whopping 17 times more expensive to learn in Columbia University. But unlike those uh, ramen and Big Mac, we may not be comparing apple to apple. So the contents of the education uh, may be quite different. So I, I don't take this as um, as um, uh, as much as you know it shows as seventeen times. Okay, so my presentation uh, I will show you that um, um, how the yen depreciation has happened and um, uh, and also lower inflation in Japan consistently in the last three decades compared to the U.S. and Europe. And the uh, convenient uh, statistics we have is called the real exchange rates. Uh, and um, I will show you how to, uh, how to interpret uh, this real exchange rates. And um, my conclusion is that the difference in this, these prices are actually the reflection of the productivity gains and wages. Wages reflect uh, productivity gains. So somehow Japanese industries have been lagging the US and, and other economies in producing productivities in Japan. And uh, if you know, we think of the, uh, the um, uh, policy pr prescriptions, we need to think of uh, to raise uh, productivity in Japan. And for that, I would say labor market reform and university reform would be uh, very important. So this is my presentation. Okay, let's start um, uh, looking at the um, two components, nominal exchange rates and inflation rate differentials. So this is the um, nominal exchange rate between uh, uh, the um, in, in US dollar Japanese yen uh, for the last uh, 30 years. And there were two episodes of sharp yen depreciation around 1988 and now, this year. Uh, so, but in between, there are uh, appreciation phase, depreciation, appreciation, and depreciation. So, um, in looking at the nominal exchange rate, the peak in yen's value was once in 1985 and another time in 2012. And it was um, uh, the peak was 75 yen per dollar. And uh, now we are close to 150. So the, uh, the value of the yen in terms of the US dollar has, um, uh, halved, has been halved for uh, the last um, uh, 10 years. OK, second component, price levels. So this is a price level, price index uh, level normalized uh, in 1985 and how prices have risen in the US, it's almost double uh, since 1985. And in Japan, it has been basically flat. So over the period, uh, long, long period, um, actually prices, uh, price differential, inflation differential has contributed uh, big uh, while nominal exchange rates uh, uh, fluctuated um, up and down. Okay, so this is the um, uh, inflation rates. Uh, the, the previous slide was price level. This is inflation rates. And only in Japan, 
Uh, and the point of this um, uh, is that uh, there, there are three inflation rates that we commonly use. One is a headline, including everything. And the uh, less food, fresh food, is called the core in Japan. And less fresh food and energy is called the core. core. And as you see, there was a, a spike uh, in uh, uh, 2008. Uh, and uh, but it quickly went down uh, in the global financial crisis. Abenomics here, which is uh, shaded here, uh, it's um, somewhere between uh, zero and two and quite stable. Then we had a uh, COVID and we had a uh, uh, sort of negative inflation rate, but now it quickly is rising. And just moments ago, it was um, uh, announced that headline for October, uh, which is you know this the end of this graph is September, but now we have the one more data points that headline is three point seven, core is three point six, and Quaqua is two point five. So now it's the um, uh, uh, interesting that uh, we we are now uh, achieving the uh, inflation targeting of 2%. So we will see, uh, I think we, uh, it will be a vigorous discussion that how the monetary policy should change or not, but that's a different story from uh, today's topic. Okay, so this is average wages and US is increasing since this is from 1990 and it's um, uh, in US dollars, converted to US dollars and com com uh, comparable in US dollars. So Japan again is flat and US has been rising about 3% year and other G7 countries also moderately uh, increasing. This is adding Korea and Sweden. Japan is still the bottom and Korea and Sweden overtook uh, Japan. So um, wage in Japan has been very stagnant. And so um, has the prices been. Okay, so combining these two prices and nominal exchange rate, uh, exchange rates, we get the um, uh, effective exchange rates. And nominal eff uh, effective means that we, uh, I have just comp com compared US uh, and Japan, but effective means that we compare the you know, uh, trading partners and um, uh, weight the trading partners um, uh, exchange rates and also inflation differential. And nominal means that you just uh, weight average the uh, exchange rates of the trading partners and real means you add inflation differential. Okay, so this is the Japan's uh, nominal effective exchange rate and real effective exchange rates. And blue is nominal, red is real. Okay, so the difference between blue and red is the contribution of the weighted average of reinflation differential between Japan and trading partners. So as I mentioned before, the peak of the nominal exchange rate of yen, either vis-a-vis -vis US dollar or the weighted average of the trading partners, there are two peaks that uh, 1995 and 2012. But if you look at the real effective exchange rate, the red uh, uh, line, the peak, clear peak was 1995. And since then it has been declining. So what's the difference? Again, this is the inflation uh, rate differential. So prices, stagnant prices compared to the trading partners uh, is as important as the uh, exchange rate, nominal exchange rate uh, movements. So that's why we, we need to understand why the prices are so stagnant uh, while exchange rates are fluctuating up and down. Okay, so real explanation I, I would call is that um, uh, this Japan is cheap phenomena 
uh, is actually rooted in the uh, real productivities. So that's what I wanted to uh, convey. And uh, I'm going to skip the um, uh, uh, discussion of balanced assumptions. In fact, because I couldn't, um, I couldn't uh, prove that there was a balance, uh, reverse balanced assumptions effect. But the um, looking at this um, uh, productivity uh, differential between U U.S. as a one and uh, Japanese productivities for manufacturing was declining from uh, mid 1990s to the end of 2000s. And, but the, it kind of rebounded uh, later. Services, it has been uh, steadily declining uh, in, in Japan. So basically Jap Japanese uh, workers, this is labor productivity. So Japanese workers uh, contribution to uh, value added compared to the US has been declining for a long time. And probably that contributes to the wage differential. And I skip this. So this is the um, another way of looking at industry by industry, how the productivities, labor productivities are compared. And I matched uh, those uh, 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 industries uh, from Japanese source and US source. And again, it has been very much declining. Uh, except uh, uh, one, one, uh, uh, one, one product uh, known ferrous metals, but all others, uh, it's declining. E either it's uh, more service oriented or uh, manufacturing. Okay, so summing up that um, exchange, nominal exchange rate has been uh, fluctuating, fluctuating widely, but inflation rate in Japan has been steadily below inflation rate in the US and uh, other G7 uh, uh, countries. And both these prices and exchange rates contributed to the decline in uh, real eff effective exchange rate since 1995. And this is the um, uh, phenomena of uh, what we call uh, cheap Japan. And um, uh, my uh, my um, view is that the root cause is the uh, declining productivities uh, in Japan compared to the US. So later, I'd like to discuss the prices and wages and productivity, but let's um, hear the um, uh, Watanabe-san's story. And um, uh, uh, we, we, we like to um, uh, compare the um, uh, discussion uh, compared the arguments of my argument and that uh, Stoma's argument. So, uh, floor is yours, Stoma. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me into this very, very interesting dialogue with Taka. It's my great pleasure to talk with you. And um, so, uh, um, so I, uh, I'd like to talk uh, about my views and uh, try to uh, compare uh, my view with, with Taka's view. Uh, could, could you go to that next slide? So, uh, in my so I think the Taka already talked about uh, what what cheap Japan means, and so I focus on three questions: uh, why it happened, and the second question I like to address is what are the likely consequences of cheap Japan, and finally I like to say something about uh, policy implications. Next slide. So as Taka already mentioned. Cheap Japan is just a phenomena about the real exchange rate. So, uh, so I, I'm, I'm also focusing on the real exchange rate, in particular, why we have a, a real appreci uh, depreciation of the yen in the recent period. That's the focus uh, of my talk, and also that was the talk focus of it, or Taka's talk. And here I show uh, several lines. Dotted line is uh, um, um, nominal effective exchange rate. And the real effective exchange rate; those are the um, num uh, those are figures shown by Taka, and those are taken from uh, from probably by from BIS uh, dataset. And uh, however, I, for some reason, I, I I do use a different dataset, which is which I I produce by, by myself. And uh, unfortunately, this is not uh, effective rate, but but, but just simple uh, nominal. Uh, sorry, this simple uh, real exchange rate. So it could be the case that the two series could be different. However, I checked that the two series 
I mean, the series uh, Taka used and the series I used uh, is not that much different. You can see that nominal, nominal exchange rate I use, uh, which is a uh, uh, solid um, bed line, is not that much different from the uh, dotted line, which was used by Taka. And also the blue line, blue solid line, this is a real uh, exchange rate I use. And this is not that much different from the series used by Taka, which is blue dotted line. Okay, so the data is okay. And uh, so, so the first thing I'd like to, so next slide please. The first thing I'd, I'd like to do is to, you know, kind of place uh, his argument and also my argument in a kind of unified framework so that uh, we can compare the difference and similarity between the two arguments. So to do so, I'd, I'd like to use some framework, uh, I'd like to uh, borrow some framework from Engel's paper in, in 1999. That is, a that is related to the decomposition of the real exchange rate. So according to this, uh, this decomposition, real exchange rate, uh, real yen dollar rate is decomposed into two parts. The first part is deviation from the PPP, which is shown by the blue, uh, blue you know, uh, colors. And the second part, second component is international relative price of non tradable Let me start with the first one, first component, deviation from the PPP. So the deviation from the PPP is the uh, sort of, uh, price of tradable in the US minus price of tradable in Japan. This is the PPP. So, and also, so, uh, so that this part is, could be deviate from nominal exchange rate. So nominal uh, exchange rate plus um, and this relative price um, between tradables and, uh, sorry, uh, between tradables in, in Japan and tradables in, in, in the US is a deviation from the PPP. So this is the first component. The second component is a slightly compl complicated. Here, I, I compare uh, price of non-tradables in the US with price of tradables in the US. So they are both in the US prices, but one is non-tradable and the other one is tradable. So this is a relative price of tradables, I'm sorry, relative price of non-tradables in the US. And you can do the same thing for Japan price of non-tradable, non relative price of non-tradable in Japan. And then finally, I take a difference between the two. That is why I call this international relative price of non-tradable. So, so the point is that we can decompose the exchange rate into these two uh, different components. That's the, that's the only thing I, I want to emphasize. And if you um, assume that the PPP holds then the deviation from the PPP goes away. So we can uh, ignore the blue part. We can focus only on the uh, red part. And also, um, we, as, as Daka mentioned, the uh, um, um, price of non tradables in the US and, and the price of non tradables in the US, the, the difference between the two is uh, coming from the uh, difference in, in productivity of non-tradable in the US and non-tradable in the US. So in some sense, relative price can be rewritten in terms of uh, the productivity differential. And if you, if you do that, I, we, uh, go, we are able to get uh, some sort of formula uh, 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 produced by Barasa and Samuelson. That's the, five, uh, the, the last line of this slide. I mean, here exchange rate, is completely determined by international data, relative productivity on or non tradable. That's the final line of this, of this slide. So I, I, we can comp completely, no, 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 we can completely ignore the, no, no, could you go back to this? Yes. Uh, we can completely ignore the uh, deviation from the PPP. So uh, usually, or maybe Taka discussed, made his discussion, tried to make his discussion based on the, the final equation, I mean, the Barassa Summons equation. However, I do not believe that the PPP hold every period. So I do not do that. I, I, I come back to the original uh, decomposition proposed by Engel. 
which is uh, uh, which is still uh, uh, considering the deviation from the so what I do I will do using my data is to decompose the exchange rate into deviation from the PPP and the international relative pricing module. That's what I will do in, in my using my data set. Could you go to the next slide? The first thing I, I'd like to share with you is this figure. This one is a deviation from the PPP and also international relative pricing module. And you can see, so this is, uh, again, this is uh, uh, quite uh, consistent with Stuckard's argument. You can see that in, something happened in uh, 1995 and the deviation from PPP, you know, before that um, deviation from PPP you know, declining, declining in the, uh, appreciation. And after, uh, after that deviation from PPP increased, increased means uh, uh, depreciation. And similarly, you can see that international relative price non increased to some extent since uh, 1995. So these two lines indicate that uh, both components, deviation from GP and international relative price of non both components contributed to, uh, to the real depreciation of the yen. So again, so again, this is the very good news and which is consistent with the Packard argument. And could you go back to the next, go to the next slide? So now I'm ready to kind of do some um, um, quantitative evaluation of the two components. And uh, during the period of 1995 until 2022, uh, real exchange rate depreciated by 3.92% per year. This is a fact, okay? And uh, I think the number used by, by Taka is almost uh, the same as, as this one. So I decompose this number into the two, 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 two parts. The first part is deviation from PPP. The contribution is 3.21%. And the other factor is the international relative price of natural goods. And the, co the a component uh, so the contribution was uh, uh, positive, but it's very small, 0.72%. So both contribute to the real, real, real depreciation of the yen. However, a dominant, dominant contribution is coming from the deviation from PP, not from international relative price and natural So this, uh, this, uh, indic uh, this means that uh, you know, sort of balanced Amazon story or reverse balanced Amazon story is not working here. What was dominant or determinant of real depreciation in the yen was the deviation from the PPP. That's the uh, first thing I'd like to emphasize in my presentation. Could you go to the next? So I, I now want to see the deviation from the PPP because this is the most important component contributing to the uh, real depreciation. I now use uh, um, uh, uh, so monthly data rather than annual data so that I can see more high frequency movement. Here I showed um, um, deviation from PPP and nominal interest rate, nominal exchange rate and uh, PPP itself. I mean, uh, Japanese tradable price and relative to US tradable price. And, and so the shaded area, the first shaded area is the DOJ's monetary easing period, which started in 2013. And you can clearly see that um, the uh, also, uh, nominal exchange rate depreciated significantly during this period due to the uh, crude monetary easing. However, what I like to focus uh, what I would like to focus here is that the deviation from PP also uh, increased significantly. So, um, what we should expect uh, is that. Uh, Japanese price, Japanese tradable price also increased significantly. And how, and actually it did, it did, it, 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 uh, it, it, it increased to some extent, but the extent it increased is very, very limited. Tradable price in Japan increased to, um, increased to some extent, but the extent was um, very, very limited. That's why we have a deviation from PPP. So um, basically what, what happened was that monetary easing was conducted 
So the nominal exchange rate depreciate. So this is okay. However, what we should see was that the price, Japanese price, should increase relative to, to US price, but it, was, it, it did not happen. That is why we see we had a deviation from PPP. Okay, so my argument is that the deviation from PPP is closely related to monetary use. I mean, it actually happened due to the combination of price stickiness in Japan and monetary use. And a quite similar thing happened in the most recent period. In, in this period, um, what happening was uh, what the man, uh, 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 what happening was uh, monetary e monetary tightening on the in the U.S. side. So Fed start monetary easing in uh, 2022, and then um, uh, nominal exchange rate start depreciate again. So this is okay. However, the question was. Um, um, so the, this depreciation of, of the yen is coming with a higher prices in Japan, but it not it did not happen. Again, the Japanese price was sticky, so it, it, it did not respond very well, and that's why we had a deviation from PPP again. So you can clearly see that uh, these two monetary changes, BOJ and Fed, created a significant uh, real depreciation of the yen. And which is creating, uh, which created uh, a cheap Japan. So you go to the next slide. So let, let me summarize what, uh, what I, I, I said so far. So I said that the uh, real exchange rate depreciated since 1995, and the contribution, I, 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 I calculated the contribution of the two factor, and I, I concluded that deviation from PP was an important factor. And also I said that. Uh, uh, deviation from a PV took place because um, Japanese price and, and wages were very sticky and the monetary policy changes were uh, big on, on, the, on the Japan side and also the uh, US side. That's the uh, reason why we, we see a cheap, cheap Japan we are right now in, in, uh, in its data set. That's the, uh, 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 that's, uh, that's the argument I made in, in my presentation. Could you go to the next slide? So this idea that um, when monetary easing happen, nominal exchange rate depreciate, but prices usually do not uh, increase that much, and then the uh, exchange rate depreciate. This idea itself is not my own idea. It actually, it, it dates back to the, to the very famous paper by uh, Don Donbush in, in, in the 70s. And, and there are also this discussion um, um, on, on, on this that paper, even in this period, and there are lots of papers producing along that line, even right now. So, so I, I just borrow the idea from those papers. However, what I would like to emphasize here, uh, stickiness, price stickiness in Japan is particularly high here, um, here in Japan. So that's why this sort of you know, overshooting um, mechanism worked very, very sharply, very, very strongly in the, in the data. That's why we have a, a cheap Japan in the, in the data. Could you go to the next slide? So um, next, I, I'd like to say something about uh, why Japanese price and wages are so sticky, because that could be, that seems to be the reason why we have a, uh, we have a cheap Japan. So uh, as all, probably all, all, all people know, or, and also as Taka already emphasized uh, using his data, uh, Japan, Japanese CPI inflation rate has been basically zero since, uh, since 1995. And people often call this a deflation. And when we say deflation, it, it's a, it means that the CPI fall, and however, uh, this kind of sort of phenomena uh, did not happen in Japan. What happened was that the uh, uh, inflation rate in Japan has been uh, basically zero since 1995. So, so, and, and so this, this is, uh, this is the, the terminology uh, commonly used in Japan. And I, I follow it uh, in my presentation. And the most important thing about this phenomenon is that uh, not only the average of individual prices does not change, but also that individual price themselves 
do not change at all. So this is a very big difference. I mean, average doesn't change. It's okay. However, what happening is that individual prices um, do not change at all. So this, there is a sharp distinction between the two. And this uh, um, so that similar thing uh, is actually happening uh, for wages. And so in, in that sense, individual prices and wages have been very, very um, sticky as if they are frozen. That's the a situation in, in Japan. And that's the reason why we have a cheap Japan. And how, uh, by the way, um, prices and price and wage thickness was not that much um, different from other countries, let's say, until the early 1990s, as far as I, data, I see the data. However, it increased significantly in the late 90s and uh, has remained high since then. Could you go to the next slide? I will show some, some pictures. So, so this one shows um, CPI goods, service, and wages between Japan and the US. So I, I'm, I'm now showing the level of um, CPI and wages. You can see that um, up until, let's say, 1995, um, even in Japan, every line, every three, every, uh, all of three lines, you know, kind of upward sloping, and the slope of, is almost identical with the US. So it, everything was okay. However, after 1995, in the, on, in the US data, we see a uh, uh, still continuing uh, upward sloping curve. However, for Japan, uh, wage and uh, CPI goods and CPI services, all of the three lines is some sort of you know, poly horizontal. So movement has uh, stopped uh, abruptly. And it, it continued uh, even uh, in the, to the, the, you know, under the very recent period. So this is what people call uh, deflation. Could you go to the next slide? So I, I, uh, so however, I, I'd like to say more than that. I mean that, uh, so, um, so uh, here I calculate um, um, inflation rate for individual items, CPI items. For example, for Japan, we have uh, 600 items and using the CPI. So we can calculate inflation, 600 inflation rate for each uh, item. So, uh, so this is the uh, figure, um, the kind of histogram of item level uh, inflation in Japan. And that, uh, to, to compare Japanese situation, uh, I, I showed US and other countries. For example, you can, if you start from the um, uh, US um, result, you can see that the uh, peak or mode of the distribution is somewhere around the 2.5%. 2, 2. So this is the, this, this figure is coming from 2014. And at that time, um, most of the US items decoded 2.5%. And similarly, uh, UK and Canada, um, mode is somewhere uh, 1.5 or 2%, 2, 2 something like that. However, for Japan, the mode is located zero, which means that uh, most of the item recorded zero inflation in this particular month. Actually, the percentage of uh, uh, near zero inflation rates was somewhere around 50%. So half of the item recorded uh, zero inflation rate. Could you go to the next slide? So the, the upper, upper panel shows the percentage of CPI item with near zero inflation rate. As I said in the previous slide, um, right now it, it's almost, it's like uh, 50% or 40%, it's very high. However, before 1995, it was not that high. It was only 10% or 20%, which is almost comparable to the other country. So before 1995, uh, there was no uh, such thing that uh, there are lots of so the Japanese situation, it, it current situation is that uh, there are lots of near zero inflation rate items, but before 1995, there was no such a situation. Uh, however, suddenly, uh, somewhere around the 95, um, late 90s, we, we started to see a, a high percentage of CPI items with near zero inflation rates. Similarly, we can see this um, um, similar thing for wages. The um, lower panel shows that the percentage of companies 
that do not do any uh, wage changes. And again, somewhere late 1990s, um, those percentage increased significantly, which means that uh, a number of companies that do not change wages at all through the Shunto uh, increase significantly. So wages and prices stop rising um, in some, somewhere in, in, in the late 90s. That's the uh, fact uh, about Japan, and that's a specific price and wage stickiness I'd like to emphasize in my presentation. Could you go to the next? So, so far, everything was uh, you know, a historical event. But I can and show the uh, more recent uh, number, and this is coming from from, uh, from September CPI, and, and I, ca I calculate the uh, 600 inflation item level inflation rate, and, and I do that, and uh, and, and do that. I I did the uh, histogram, and you can see that uh, lots of prices related to energy they had a, a very high inflation, which is, which I call acute inflation. And however, uh, we still see uh, a chronic deflation. That means that uh, there's a P at, uh, at zero, which means that uh, there are still lots, lots of items with the near zero inflation rate. So the situation doesn't change even right now. Even right now, we still have a sort of deflation, although we have an inflation in addition to the deflation. So in that sense, we have a um, so, sort of simultaneous occurring of deflation and inflation right now. Could you go to the next? So um, let me finally uh, touch on the consequences on policy implications of Japan. And uh, my, uh, so, so uh, my, uh, so I, 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 um, what I, what, what I said was that uh, um, everything related to uh, price and wage stickiness and the monetary easing created the cheap Japan, that, that, that's my story. So in that sense, this is a kind of sort of nominal story. And probably Taka's story is something like a real story and a real explanation. And uh, so, uh, so given this uh, nominal explanation, my, uh, my uh, uh, idea what will, what will happen is that, uh, some, that sometime in the, in the future, um, price arbitrage and wage arbitrage will work very well. And then uh, keep Japan will go away. Go away. That's my my basic idea. That's my, my expectation about the future. And actually, uh, arbitrage in terms of price and wage is already going on. For example, foreign investors are now increasing purchasing uh, land and real estate in areas such as Niseko or Hokkaido and Kyoto. And uh, those um, purchasing behavior result in higher real prices. And also I heard that uh, wages in those areas increase significantly because you know, lots of constructions are going on. And, and also if they build a if foreigner build a, uh, hotels, then wages are much higher than the local level. And so wages are, in the local wages increase in, in those areas. So in that sense, um, uh, at least for, as far as real estate and uh, local wages, uh, uh, so sort of uh, arbitrage is going on. And also we see uh, some sign that uh, uh, there is uh, um, some sign that uh, um, wage arbitrage in companies like uh, NTT, and where uh, there is a sort of uh, brain drain because um, um, so let's say uh, Google and other Amazon and those companies offer high very high salary to young talented guys working at uh, working for NTT, and they move to uh, US companies. And given those um, um, brain drain and companies like NTT are now thinking about improving their comp compensation to to prevent this kind of uh, brain drain. So in in that sense, uh, wage arbitrage is already started to happen. In, in, here in Japan. So, uh, so all those things are still you know, uh, you know, kind of uh, just started and uh, we, we need to probably need to some time to see, uh, um, to see, to see uh, Chief Japan is gone uh, completely 
but uh, still, uh, my my hope and my expectation is that uh, Chief Japan will, will go away in the future. And finally, I, I'd like to say that very, very significant change is now going on with respect to the price and the GDP. Could you go to the next? Oh, sorry, could you uh, go to the 18? No, 19, I'm sorry. So this is a um, de uh, daily uh, 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 inflation rate I, I calculate with my colleagues. And the most recent number, so, uh, which was published, uh, it, it was a date, a date for, for uh, two days ago, was 6.07%. Uh, Taka mentioned that the number, CPI number released today was 3.6%. And uh, however, our index indicated more than 6%. And you can see that uh, you know, the speed of the increase was significant, which is uh, not like uh, uh, what, what we saw during the earthquake, what we saw during QE, what we saw during the state of emergency. So it's, it's a, it's not, it's, there is no comparable example in the past. So something very um, um, different is going on in prices. In the next slide. Also, big movement is now taking. Could you go to the next slide? Yeah. Um, also, big movement is now going on in wages. So this is a uh, um, sh um, Shunto uh, wage increase negotiated uh, in spring wage offensive. And uh, so uh, until last year, and the, the, the number was very small, like a 2% something like that. However, uh, next year, uh, Lengo, our labor union, is aiming at achieving 5%, which is almost uh, the level uh, in 1992. So it's a, it's a very high level and we're targeting that level. Actually, uh, two weeks ago, I had a chance to attend their uh, kind of startup meeting for, for Shinto. And uh, I was impressed by the, the argument made, made there. I mean, there are lots of lots of people from uh, the union saying that, was saying that 5% is too low and we need more uh, higher nominal wage increase. That kind of argument was made in that, in that uh, start of the in that uh, kickoff meeting. So I, I, I'm I'm quite sure that uh, uh, it is it is highly likely that uh, uh, more than five percent nominal wage increase will take place next year. And that will be a very big change in nominal wage stickiness. Thank you very much. Let me stop here. Thank you, thank you, Tsutomu. Um, uh, yeah, can we go back to uh, Stoma's slides? Um, I want to emphasize that uh, page uh, 14 of uh, Stoma's um, uh, slides and um, the uh, page 14. So I really like this um, uh, uh, chart. Uh, so in Japan, this acute inflation in energy that uh, gasoline, city gas and, and others uh, which is related to imported um, uh, energy prices to be, you know, 10%, 20%, 30% of uh, price increase, while the uh, many services and other commodities um, still stuck at uh, 0%. And um, the Stone mentioned the daily inflation is now uh, 6%. <laughs> but uh, that that is picking up the uh, commodities um, uh, sold at supermarket. It mm -hmm. doesn't include uh, uh, rents. It doesn't include um, hotel services. Services. Mm -hmm. So that's the sort of you know the very different picture that Japan has. In the U.S., rents are rising and mm -hmm. uh, the service prices are rising, and um, you know some of the so-called tradables we think. The, uh, do include uh, service yeah. components like Big Mac um, uh, salesperson's wages are in the Big Mac price. So um, the um, uh, it, it, it's really uh, startling that Japan uh, in Japan that um, uh, many commodities and services are still at zero percent. And hopefully, this you know gasoline prices and others uh, inflation rate at least 
will come down probably next year. So we will see whether the um, uh, more uh, uh, uniform increase um, yeah, across yeah. industries and 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 um, uh, prices uh, uh, will will happen or not. That's the challenge next year. Okay, so let's stop the slides and uh, let's. Could, could you say one more word about about this this figure? Yeah. yeah. What? Could you could you mention about this figure again? Yeah. So as Dakar mentioned, and um, so we have a uh, acute inflation as well as a uh, sort of chronic deflation. When so I always say that we Japanese economy has now two diseases, so it's a complicated situation. For example, in the US, they have they have an inflation, and uh, so they have one disease, and then uh, Fed what what the Fed is to do is to prescribe some medicine to that disease, which is an uh, 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 interest rate hike. So we, we, everything is simple. However, for Japan, we have two diseases. And uh, some people say that even Japan should increase uh, in, uh, interest rate as, as, uh, as the Fed does. However, if, it, uh, if, it, if we do that, if the BOJ does that, probably it's, it could be a very good medicine for, to, to, to uh, inflation. However, it could be a very bad thing for deflation. And it is possible that uh, um, zero inflation rate would be much higher due to the uh, interest rate high in Japan. So, um, so the, uh, because the di diseases are different, so medicine is uh, different. It's a kind of very natural uh, um, way to think about the uh, policy difference between Japan and the US. Right, and also the uh, this uh, shows a political problem that um, uh, people buy those um, uh, ga gasoline and um, uh, uh, electricity uh, bills every month and gasoline every day, every week, probably, and feels that inflation rate is much higher than mm -hmm. the um, CPI inflation rates. And uh, politicians mm -hmm. have to respond to that uh, pressure. Uh, on mm -hmm. the perception of um, uh, uh, inflation, so that's kind of added problem uh, to 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 Japan. So um, let's stop the slides and let's. Um, uh, so we we share a lot of a um, lot of facts and and arguments in common, but the slight difference in emphasizing whether um, nominal phenomena explains a cheap Japan or real phenomena explains uh, the um, uh, cheap Japan. So uh, maybe we can start um, um, uh, discussing um, uh, why why the prices are so sticky and you're the expert on the prices. So um, the uh, is, is it because, uh, you know, wages are low? This is a circular argument of the prices sticky because wages are sticky, wages are sticky because prices are sticky. And that's one argument. Uh, another is more psychological that um, uh, deflationary mindset is still there so that uh, companies are afraid of raising prices uh, or uh, you know, afraid of losing customers by raising prices. Um, but th this may be a uh, uh, little bit changing uh, this year uh, that we see many prices arising, but uh, so, Psychological or circular argument mm. to try to explain the price stickiness. But what is now? What is the current view of yours on how okay. why this is okay. so sticky? Yeah. Um, so, um, so this is a very very hard question uh, to me, and uh, so it's it quite it's relatively easy to say that the prices and wages are very sticky in Japan and using the data. However. Why they are sticky is a different issue, and it's it's not so easy to answer that question. However, let, but let me let me do that. So, um, as I emphasized in my presentation, everything started in late nineties. So before that, prices were not sticky and wages were not sticky, and so some change happened in the latter half of the nineteen nineties. Okay, and uh, my my idea is that uh, financial crisis in Japan was a kind of uh, um, uh, driving force. So we had a, a financial crisis, and of course, um, consumers and um, workers are very, very um, nervous about the crisis. 
and also farms are not able to raise prices at all. So that was a time when a stickiness in prices and wages increased significantly. So this is not surprising. Thing. However, surprising thing to me was that uh, even they did say 2000, 2010, so if Jap even Jap Japanese economy is recovering and the BOJ, for example, BOJ stopped QE, passed their first QE in 2006. So it seems that the economy went back to the normal. However, still, even during that time, still prices and wages were sticky, continue to be sticky. That was a surprising and, and very um, hard to understand what, what, why the, it was the case. So I have, I have two kind of uh, uh, explanation on this. The first one is that the policy. So government and uh, Bank of Japan, those people did not pay any attention to prices during those periods. I mean, 2000, 2010, up until, so uh, uh, Prime, Prime Minister Abe started to say something about uh, price stickiness. However, before that, nobody talked about it. That means that the so prices did not decline. So there was no big depression in Japan. Price was still stay, kind of stable. So CPI inflation, was, uh, inflation rate was at zero. And so it seems that this, is, this was okay. So, and also BOJ was very, very reluctant to act, um, you know, adopt, uh, act, um, adopt some, something like inflation targeting. So um, they have an implicit uh, kind of targeting, which was uh, uh, zero inflation rate in terms of CPI. So there was no reason to change their policy to raise a crisis uh, inflation rate, let's say, to, to, to something like 2%. Or so. So those kind of uh, policy attitude created uh, uh, price stickiness and the wage stickiness. So that's one explanation. The other explanation is coming from probably labor union and companies. And again, um, something happened in the 1890s. So probably Itaka knows much better than what happened during that, that period. So in 1995, we had a huge, huge appreciation of the yen. So at that time, people uh, uh, in companies were talking about wages in terms of the US dollar was too high for Japanese farms. And actually that was, that, that was almost like a number one in the world. So Japanese workers uh, were paid too much, uh, at least in terms of US dollar. So given that kind of very high nominal wage in Japan, uh, many companies said that it is almost impossible to uh, compete with uh, with Chinese farms and so on. So they they so the late 90, 90s they said that we need um, um, kind of closing wages, otherwise we cannot compete with uh, with uh, the, the, those companies from the, the China and the other countries. So. Um, so they, they had a, such such a kind of uh, created such kind of labor market practice during the 1990s, late 1990s, and they maintained it even 2000, even 2010. Uh, probably even right now they still have such kind of um, practice in, in, in the company. So the, those companies behave in another, another reason why uh, sticky uh, prices and wages. So. Um, which means that uh, what we need is to have a different, uh, you know, uh, ideas on on the policy front, and also we need a different idea on the corporate side to 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 cope with the plasticness. Thank you. Um, let me add uh, some comments um, in line with uh, Stone's argument and um, uh, put some of my views. Uh, the, uh, something happened in the mid uh, 1990s or late mm -hmm. 1980s, exactly um, uh, exactly the point. And I, I would put that as uh, some mentioned the banking crisis or financial crisis of 1997 mm -hmm. and eight that the big financial institutions, Yamai, mm -hmm. Kai Takshoku, uh, failed. And actually, employees were um, uh, uh, employees were. Um, uh, uh, cut, you know, they lost jobs. And that mm -hmm. was um, 
you know, unthinkable at the time mm -hmm. that uh, big, com big, big financial institutions would actually fail and employee employees were asked to leave. And that put a huge shock on the workers and they changed the views to let's keep the you know job safety, let's mm -hmm. keep the jobs instead of demanding high wages. And mm -hmm. that was a structural change in the um, trade unions um, uh, behavior and the workers um, uh, psyche, I would say, uh, on how, how the labor uh, should, should behave. And this is um, uh, this, this um, uh, prolonged and continued probably mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. today, until today. And this is now putting a, a lot of um, pro problems because those, those um, are going for the job safety rather mm -hmm. than the uh, wage hike is mm -hmm. more, uh, uh, is, is stronger among the, uh, uh, the workers with uh, 50s and 60s. So uh, age, um, you know, probably age, uh, after age 50, that people become more conservative and, and mm -hmm. try to uh, protect their jobs. Um, and younger people are actually underpaid uh, in Japan uh, because of this, um, uh, uh, the uh, lifetime employment and the seniority wage mm -hmm. system. So there is a conflicting uh, uh, objectives uh, uh, in, among the uh, young, between the young workers and, uh, and older uh, workers. And uh, this is not good for the companies um, uh, uh, increasing productivities and also putting uh, best workers in the best uh, uh, jobs and including between Japan and, and, and overseas. So Stone is right, something happened in the mid nineties and uh, Japanese companies start to move the jobs uh, abroad, uh, building the factories mm. in the US, Europe. And, and um, what happened was that, that that was good thing for the Japanese companies. And it was good thing for you know, solving trade tensions but the results, long-term results, was that um, those uh, uh, growth of the employment, growth of wages, growth of productivities shifted to abroad from Japan, even mm -hmm. in the same company. So multinationals in Japan are now earning more in uh, uh, abroad, more than 50% of the earnings of the multinationals coming from abroad rather than within Japan. And this is not good probably for mm. uh, Japanese workers and explain some of the wage stickiness. Um, so um, that's, the, uh, that's my view. And again, those productivity is um, probably increasing abroad in the same company, Japanese companies, uh, is, um, uh, is a problem probably that we can uh, focus and try to uh, try to solve that. That's why I'm saying that this is um, a real phenomena rather than uh, nominal uh, phenomena. Uh, but yes, I, I but, but by the way, but, but uh, do you think that there, is there any force to to, uh, to achieve um, kind of uh, arbitrage? You say that the uh, young people yeah. are underpaid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Uh, and uh, however, Japan is not an isolated economy. Still, there's a movement. So people like you, you know, used to be my colleague at the, at the University of Tokyo with, with very low salary. However, now you're Colombia and with high salary. So you are now doing some arbitrage by yourself. And uh, as, I, as I mentioned, um, um, people, young, very young people working for NTT, that talented uh, engineer, they are, uh, you know, uh, moving to the U.S. because the U.S. company pay a lot to, to those young people. So then NTT themselves have to raise their wages. In, that, in this way, wage arbitrage is now taking place. And uh, as far as Japan is op an open company, country, I think we, we, we finally have some sort of uh, arbitrage uh, in terms of wages and uh, prices. Do you agree? How that? long does it take for <laughs> arbitrage to work? Mm -hmm. 
there, there is, uh, you know, there is uh, in the in, in the economics of literature there is a, a, a hysteresis argument. Once the, mm. the factory is in in the U.S. and mm. China, it's very difficult to bring them up back to, mm. to Japan. Now that it makes sense to produce things in Japan with uh, this cheap Japan mm -hmm. uh, phenomena, but uh, they are slow and reluctant mm -hmm. uh, to move back those uh, factories. So there is a um, time lag and mm -hmm. um, it takes a long time. And while that is happening, that I think Japanese uh, workers continue to suffer, young workers mm -hmm. continue to mm -hmm. suffer. So, um, so, um, so we uh, touched on prices and wages and and um, uh, productivities and um, let's try to pick up some questions from uh, uh, Q and A box and I think um, we answered why the uh, those problems in the nineties start, started in nineties continue to a uh, continue into two thousand two thousand tens. One question is asking you, Tsutomu, about the whether uh, fiscal theory of place levels uh, that you once um, uh, argued have anything to do with the um, uh, anything to do with the uh, cheap Japan phenomena. <laughs> is fiscal? We didn't discuss anything about fiscal policy. Mm -hmm. so, but fiscal policy has any place in the discussion? Yeah, okay. <clears throat> so I did write a um, book on FPPL um, 10, 10 years ago, I guess. And um, so, however, FTPL is based on the assumption that uh, fiscal authority uh, lacks uh, fiscal discipline. When, so the, uh, more specifically, when, um, 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 Fiscal authority lacks the fiscal uh, discipline, then uh, prices is determined by fiscal rate. That's the essence of the FPL. So the question is whether the Japanese fiscal authority is uh, is lacking fiscal discipline or not. And some some people say that they already lost fiscal discipline. And if that is the case, uh, we see uh, 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 because we we still we already have a accumulated huge amount of uh, public debt. So yes. it is not natural to see that uh, we have we see a uh, uh, price increase due to the fiscal reason. If, if the fiscal authority does lack fiscal uh, discipline. However, uh, we don't see anything like that. I mean, price increase due to the fiscal reason, which means so to, to me, to me it, it seems to me that uh, that the uh, People still believe that the Japanese fiscal authority have a, a st still strong fiscal discipline, and that's why um, you know, uh, some sort of fiscal regime is not applicable here uh, right, right now in Japan. However, um, so my my concern along this line is that once the BOJ start increase interest rate, well, probably um, uh, interest rate associated with JGB will increase and um, significantly. And then that will have a um, fiscal implication, I mean, uh, uh, fiscal surplus, will, uh, fiscal deficit increase significantly. And then um, it, it, it is likely that it, it will have a, it will have a, so it, it, it means that fiscal, uh, fiscal situation gets getting worse. And uh, so the FTPL says that the uh, uh, price will, uh, Increase and more in, in, in the future, and actually this is um, this is similar similar but a different thing was said by Chris Sims several years ago when um, he he said that uh, it is the Japanese uh, government uh, sorry, uh, sorry Japanese central bank BOJ did monetary easing, however uh, government did monetary uh, fiscal tightening and uh, introducing the uh, consumption tax and so on, and raising consumption tax and so on. And uh, he, so uh, Chris Sim criticized that situation because uh, you know, improving fiscal situation is not a bad thing for, def for deflation. It, it, it deteriorates deflation. That's, the, that's his argument. 
So um, I'm not sure what will happen on, on the fiscal side, but uh, it is possible that in the future, fiscal uh, issue will come up when we talk about, uh, or talk about uh, inflation in Japan. So um, probably next year or next next year, <laughs> but, uh, when, when we solve the cheap Japan, Problem by arbitrage or the um, or normalization of the monetary policy. Next problem will probably happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's that's not a uh, very happy prediction, but that's, uh, <laughs> we we kind of agree. Okay, so um, uh, one more uh, another question is uh, sort of re related to. The, uh, this um, why the PPP uh, uh, even in tradables um, uh, did not happen. Uh, so typical, uh, the question uh, from the audience goes, so we, uh, typically we see nominal exchange rate depreciation in high inflation countries uh, were, uh, associated with the um, uh, higher inflation, sorry, nominal depreciation cause higher inflation or higher inflation cause nominal depreciation. That's the usual uh, mm. usual association, but that's just opposite. Uh, uh, just opposite is happening in Japan. <laughs> nominal depreciation is happening and the inflation differential is widening and that contributes in double way the cheap Japan. And why this depreciation is not, um, uh, causing the uh, imported inflation and inflation. Of course, we can say it's all in lags, but do, do you have any um, views on this um, uh, relationship between uh, nominal depreciation and uh, inflation differential go goes um, uh, opposite way uh, from uh, what we usually teach in textbook? <laughs> okay. Uh, so but one way to answer that question is that, is that, uh, that the Japanese consumers are quite different from uh, consumers in other countries. And in, in, the, in the sense that uh, we hate, consumers hate price hike. And uh, I, I have a lot of data on, on that. And uh, so in some sense, you know, demand curve is kink in the sense that when price is higher, demand decreases significantly in Japan. So that in that sense, um, demand curve itself is different from other countries. And given though this sort of very sensitive price sensitive behavior of consumers, firms are reluctant to raise prices, at least in the past. That, 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 that's why we had a, a price difference. And the, even right now, some of the firms have still, uh, uh, still fear that they will lose their customers once they change their, once they raise their prices. So that's why they, they are not able to pass through cost increase to their prices. So that's also that's one way to, to explain why, 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 why prices are still sticky and prices do not uh, respond to the depreciation in the yen, even right now. However, I think the situation is now changing quite rapidly. And uh, as far as the survey I conducted very recently, it indicates that, uh, that the Jap even Japanese consumers are not that much reluctant to price hike, and almost it, they are uh, uh, similar to the other to the consumers in other countries. So uh, things are changing because uh, one one reason is that, as Taka mentioned, inflation expectation here in Japan is now changing. Now even uh, consumers expect that price is high, will, will, will be higher. In the future, so inflation, our inflation expectation is almost comparable to the to the other countries. So, given that change in inflation expectation, um, consumer behavior is now changing. So, probably um, in the near future, we see a different picture um, in terms of the uh, price dipiness. Yeah. Um, other thing I, I'd like to say about that question is that uh, Japan is not. So this is not. Uh, question about Japan, but this is a question about the US. I mean, US has a high inflation right now. Okay, so they, they fail um, monetary policy or fiscal I don't know, policy failure. That's why they have a high inflation. And, uh, and also because they have a high inflation, they increase interest rate uh, very, very rapidly. So, um, so usually 
probably you also, also um, Taka um, teach uh, in the class and I do the same thing in, in my class. Usually what we see is that uh, when there is a policy mistake and because of that inflation that inflation takes, takes place, then the currency of that country should depreciate, right? But what we see that the currency of that country and the US is now appreciating rather than depreciating. And it seems that, so this is of course, of course in some sense, some way related to the Japanese situation, but uh, I, I, I guess the main cause of the, the, of the nominal depreciation is on the US side. And I, I'm not quite sure why people, investors still try to buy US uh, asset, if Dara asset, even though inflation is going on and uh, uh, it's much higher than country like Japan. And uh, so those are the uh, simple questions. And not, and not, uh, and, uh, those questions are not answered very well. Do you have any good answer to those questions? Why? Well, um, this Dara, is, just goes to a uh, fundamental question on uh, what determines the nominal exchange rates mm -hmm. and whether that is more uh, influenced by the trade surplus and deficits mm -hmm. or capital flows uh, mm -hmm. in and out. And of course, the, those current accounts and uh, financial accounts are, you know, uh, uh, two sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. they, they have that identity. So if the trade drives the exchange rates, then that has influence on the capital inflow outflow. If the capital moves first, then the um, uh, current account follows with the exchange rate. Right now, I think the capital flows determines, mm -hmm. at least in the short term, capital inflows determines the exchange rate movement. That's why the uh, capital is moving into US, ap appreciating the uh, US uh, uh, dollar and uh, prices are slow moving variable compared to the exchange rate. And that is widening the um, price real uh, price, uh, real real exchange rates uh, between the U.S. and Japan. Um, that is most. That is kind of tautological explanation mm -hmm. of uh, what's happening. But but, but, but do you, do you expect that the, you know um, deviation from PPP will diminish in the future? I mean, uh, yes, I, 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 yeah, with the lag, you know, we we can. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. We can uh, talk about J-curve, we can talk about mm -hmm. um, uh, hyster hysteresis. Uh, but yeah, yes, it takes time, but I think it will it will um, uh, make the Japanese uh, companies to move back uh, operations uh, production mm -hmm. into back to Japan and Japanese workers um, uh, demand um, higher wages. And um, I think that, you know, what you call arbitrage uh, mm -hmm. will work in every uh, every layer and mm -hmm. um uh it will this chief japan will i i i i cannot say solved but the um uh, <laughs> japan phenomena will be um uh, uh mitigated uh, mm -hmm. in the next year or next two years that's mm -hmm. that's my view but also you know productivity increase in mm -hmm. japan uh by uh putting workers in the most productive um, uh, jobs and companies, labor mobility, uh, intra-firm or, or inter-firm uh, labor mobility, I think mm -hmm. will be very important in that mm -hmm. uh, uh, process. Okay, so um, the, um, uh, let, let's um, uh, try to pick up some of the, um, uh, uh, questions and um, 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 so regarding the price rigidity that uh, many companies in Japan reduce the contents of the products uh, to avoid price changes so that you know putting one you know 100 uh, gram package is now <laughs> 80, 80 gram package with the same price and that we Economists call it inflation, but you don't mm -hmm. see the price tag change in in the um, uh, in the uh, uh, on the shelf. So um, what wh why this is this has happened, and what what do you think is good or bad? Yeah, um, 
I don't, I don't know, Taka, remember this or not. I did a paper on this, about this phenomenon. I, I remember that. You, 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 using, you. using scanner data and I presented uh, a conference organized by Taka several years ago. And at that time, um, I, I, I looked at what happened, um, so let's say 2008. 2008 was the year when um, uh, oil price increased and also agricultural prices and so on also increased. So that was a period of inflation for, for Japan. And at that time, uh, actually product downsizing, number of product downsizing increased significantly. So that was the first time when we see that phenomenon. And the second time was that was in 2013 and 14, when QQE by the BOJ created a high depreciation of the yen. And that's why I know uh, imported prices increased significantly. So farms are not are not able to pass through those increases to their prices. So um, they they started to smaller product, and that, that, that was a, a, another another time. So uh, a second moment when we saw, saw the uh, increase in, in, the, in the number of um, product downsizing, and uh, given those evidence, uh, so uh, I I saw that this is closely related to the so ma marginal cost increase. When marginal cost increase, let's say, due to the depletion of the yen, then uh, usually farms uh, pass through those increase to their prices, but uh, Japanese farmers are not, are not able to do so. And so the only thing they were able to do is to just uh, do lower quality, I mean, smaller product. By doing that, they, they save money and they, they survive. That, that was my, my interpretation. And interesting, uh, and interesting is that um, this year, we, do, we didn't see uh, any big uh, increase in the number of uh, product downsizing. I, I expected that we should see a lot of downsizing in the data. However, I, don't, I didn't see that. And um, so my, my interpretation is that uh, now Jap not Japanese, uh, Japanese farmers were, were quite reluctant to change their nominal prices in the past, but now Japanese, even Japanese farms are kind of uh, able to pass through their, their cost to the to their prices. And so they do not need to do downsizing any, anymore. And so um, people still are talking about downsizing and I know that there are some uh, episodes of downside, uh, even during, during this inflation episode. But uh, remember that number of downside is now uh, kind of not that much high uh, as it, it was in, in the past, which means that uh, uh, sort of pricing power of farms are now improving or recovering. Uh, and uh, in, in that sense, the situation in, in, in price picking it is now rapidly ch changing. But, but I think that's a kind of evidence that the things are changing here. Yeah, I remember that uh, when you wrote the paper that uh, you said that to put the um, the uh, efforts and innovation into uh, yeah. how to downsize the package is mm -hmm. a very wasteful uh, investment, and uh, they should think about more um, uh, better ways of yeah, uh, putting yeah. value added um, uh, as their uh, corporate strategy. And I, I, I fully agreed with that view. And also you, you mentioned this um, uh, kink demand curve that mm -hmm. um, uh, companies do not raise prices because uh, if the other firms do not follow you, mm -hmm. then you lose market share. And um, uh, if you lower the prices, others will follow lowering prices and you do not increase your uh, market share. So that's why companies do not change prices. But this year, um, I, I, you, as you mentioned, that uh, yeah. news story headlines are full of uh, price increase stories. Mm, and yeah, yeah. October 1, 1,000 mm. items. Uh, had a price increase, and probably you see that in the daily uh, daily inflation CPI inflation rate in your in your uh, uh, study. But um, I think the now changing that if I change the price, the others will change price. Mm -hmm. Others yeah, yeah. Are changing prices, I will change. So same um, 
the kink demand curve mm -hmm. story works, something happened that everybody is now in the mind. Maybe, maybe cost mm -hmm. is um, uh, too much that they squeeze mm -hmm. the profits, but you know things are changing uh, in Japan. Okay, so um, the maybe last question uh, is that to me that um, the um, high level of investment abroad, why does it contribute to low wage in uh, in Japan? My argument is yes, the companies benefit from uh, uh, investing abroad, but uh, I've, my view is that they do not repatriate enough uh, of the profits from abroad to Japan when yen depreciated to increase wages in Japan. So um, somehow that they are holding uh, cash in Japan, holding cash in, in abroad. One third of the listed companies have the record profits, but you know they, they're not uh, 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 passed on to the uh, workers in significant ways. So we will see next year, maybe next year will be different. But um, I think the um, uh, those success in uh, abroad should be uh, should be helping uh, Japanese uh, companies. That's my view. Another question that uh, this is the last question is again uh, targeted to me that why the low productivity is usually uh, in textbook uh, contributes to higher prices because wage increase and cannot absorb in the uh, uh, productivity increase then have to increase prices. And this is part of uh, the Balasa Samuelson story that if the wage is the same in the product, in the tradables and non-tradables and the wage go up as the tradables have to increase the prices, then non-tradables cannot absorb those wage increase. So the non-tradables prices uh, become higher. That's a Balasa Samuelson. And um, that's not happening in Japan. Why? And that's a very good question. Uh, my argument is a low productivity contributes to a low wage, and uh, that lowers the um, uh, income and purchasing power, so that that translates into uh, low prices, and that's the one uh, link of the uh, uh, wage and uh, prices. Um, now we, uh, do, uh, um, I think we only have a few minutes left. And um, I'd like to uh, uh, go to the last stage. So you, Stoma, you have the uh, two minutes of uh, your last words. Okay, um, last words. Okay, uh, thank you very much again uh, for inviting me this, this very interesting discussion with Taka. And um, so probably I, I, the, what I would like emphasize in my, in my talk was that um, Something is not now changing, in, in, even in Japan. So, uh, in terms, at least in, in pricing and uh, wage determination. And so, I think everybody should be aware about that. And also, um, we need to have more price uh, flexibility. We need to have a more wage flexibility. And to do so, we need some uh, probably need some policy assistance or maybe. We need some change in, in mind uh, for, for the people working for the corporate and for, for those work, for workers. So everybody, uh, every Japanese should change their mind uh, so that uh, you know while the Japanese economy is not changing, so uh, we, uh, we should change our, 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 our own mind and uh, we should change our own behavior so that uh, Japan can escape from. Uh, finally escape from the deflation. So this is my final one. Thank you. And uh, let me add uh, my last words. And um, uh, I still think that the, um, uh, the, uh, the biggest problem uh, in Japan is uh, lack of uh, productivity increase. And um, uh, to change that, we need um, uh, we need a labor mobility and um, uh, innovation, and innovation pro uh, particularly from uh, uh, universities and uh, university-linked uh, uh, high-tech uh, startups. And um, you know, Stomu is um, uh, 
second half of as um, <laughs> capitalist. So uh, we need more of that stomach mm -hmm. to uh, uh, increase uh, productivities and mm -hmm. uh, wages income actually and so um uh with uh with that let's um uh go to the last part that um uh thank you very much for all for joining and and staying with us until the end of today's event and uh very interesting conversation with uh, Tsutomu Watanabe so thank you very much uh, Tsutomu and joining uh with me uh today and I, I truly enjoyed uh, discussing various possible okay. reasons for today's uh, cheap Japan and the impact uh, prices uh, are having on economic and political uh, development. So um, I invite you to check um, uh, CJF's website to see more about our upcoming events and the various activities we offer. And you can also follow us on Twitter and um, uh, LinkedIn. And of course, we once again thank uh, corporate and individual sponsors for their support. And it means a lot to us. And thank you again for joining us. And see you at our next event. Thank you. <laughs>